quiz two uh, docs on uniform symbolic topology. So I, I request him to uh, start this seminar. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Jugal, and thank all the organizers for allowing me this opportunity to speak. Uh, I have to warn everybody, I'm just speaking into my iPad and I can't see or hear anything really. So please, if you have questions, put them on the chat line and uh, the organizers will let me know. I'm going to continue the characteristic P method talk I started last time, but I'm going to really focus on the topic of symbolic powers and in particular a uniform property of so let me go ahead and start. Um, I'm going to be writing a lot, but the first uh, page or two I wrote out in advance. So let's begin with the definition. Uh, R will always be a commutative Noetherian ring with identity for me. I won't bother to write that. Uh, suppose you have a prime in spec R. Then the nth symbolic power of P, which I'm hoping you can read along with me, uh, which is denoted by this um, by this p uh, parentheses in is by definition the nth power of p extended to the localization and then contracted back to r i'm using matsumura's notation here r may not embed in in r localized p but here the intersection just means contracting back an equivalent way to say this is that the nth symbolic power is the p primary component of p to the n. And if you unpack the intersection here, you get uh, the following statement that we'll use quite a few times, that the nth symbolic power is the set of all elements in the ring, such that there exists an element s not in p, with S times R in P to the N. So this is probably the most useful definition in terms of actually proving things. So informally, you can think of the symbolic power, the nth symbolic power is the set of elements vanishing to order P, uh, vanishing to order, excuse me, to order N along the variety cut out by P. And we'll make that more precise in just a moment. So I want to give you some examples first. And just um, if you've never worked with symbolic powers before, these may be a little hard, but uh, it's nice to have one or two examples to think about. So it's easy to see that um, the nth power of P is always inside the symbolic nth power. That's uh, basically immediate from the fact it's the contraction of P to the N as stated right here. And uh, it's also very easy to prove that if you multiply the nth symbolic power times the mth symbolic power, it's always inside the N plus N symbolic power as of course you would expect just from um, thinking of it as vanishing to that order. So let me give you a couple examples just to hang your hat on if you haven't thought about them much. So the easiest way, uh, I should have said right here that this containment is um, most of the time not inequality. So it's not usually equal. Um, and probably the easiest way is just to do a generic example, which is always a good thing to do. So let R be a polynomial ring in three variables over a field K modded out by X, Y minus Z to the N, this hypersurface. Let P be the prime ideal in R, which is generated by X, the images of X and Z in this ring. Then, of course, y is not in p, but uh, y times x uh, is, well, y times x is z to the n, and z is in p, so therefore y times x is in p to the n. 
So what does that mean? Well, y is not in p. If you multiply it times x, you get in p to the n. So that means that x actually has to be inside the nth symbolic power of p. But notice it's not in p squared. It's not even in m squared, in fact. So where m is the um, ideal x, y, z here. So this is an example where the nth symbolic power is very far from the power. Now, the, it's nice to have examples like this. In fact, we'll, in some sense, consider many of them. But uh, you might think it's cheating because we basically just modded out a hypersurface that did what we want. So it's much harder to get interesting examples in regular rings, in some sense. But uh, here's one. So let R be a polynomial ring over a field in nine variables. I think of as a three by three generic matrix X. So I'm putting them in a matrix here. And let P be the ideal of two by two minors. Then, um, in fact, if you look at the determinant of X, it's always in the symbolic square of P and it's certainly not in P squared. Um, this has degree three. And everything in P squared is degree at least four because P is generated by quadrics. So um, the determinant of X is certainly not in P squared. Now, a quick, if you've never done this before, if you multiply by the adjoint, you get the determinant down the diagonal. And it's easy to see if you now take determinants on both sides that the determinant of x squared is the determinant of the adjoint. But the adjoint has entries in P. And the determinant, it's a three by three matrix, so the determinant of the adjoint um, therefore is in P cubed. So this puts the determinant squared in P cubed. And for the students that are listening, I suggest as an exercise, you uh, try to see what's involved in proving that if the determinant squared is in P cubed, that actually forces it into the second symbolic power. So that's an exercise. Okay, third example. If P is generated by a regular sequence, then it's well known and easy to show that the nth symbolic power is the nth power of P. So this is a case for every n. This is a case in which the symbolic powers are actually the powers. And again, for students there, it's quite easy to, who are listening, it's quite easy to prove this by using that the modules P to the J mod P to the J plus one are in fact free R mod P modules. So this is another thing you might try if you've never done it before. Finally, one last example, uh, slightly more geometric perhaps. If you take a smooth projective variety and you let P be the uh, associated ideal inside the polynomial ring in N plus one variables, then the nth symbolic power of P is in fact the so-called saturation of P to the N, which is the union of um, P to the N colon M to the J over all J at least one, where M here is the irrelevant ideal. And of course, this is pretty easy to see from three, in fact, because um, more or less off the irrelevant ideal if you invert or localize somewhere, P actually becomes a complete intersection because it defines a smooth projective variety. So everything that's happening is concentrated at the irrelevant ideal. Of course, that, it's not easy to understand these saturations, of course. So I said that you can think of the symbolic power is functions vanishing to order n along the subvariety. So that was made precise by a theorem of Zariski, I believe, 
who did this first. I'm assuming K is algebraically closed uh, just to use the null Stellan's lots here. You don't, in some sense, really need it. Um, so let K be an algebraically closed field and S a polynomial ring in D variables and P a prime in spec S. Then what Zariski showed was that the nth symbolic power is, in fact, the intersection of the nth powers of um, the maximal ideals corresponding to points on the variety. So these are the maximal ideals here that contain P. And um, I think it's self-explanatory that um, what I wrote, but this really says, you see, uh, um, elements in the nth power of x1 minus alpha 1 through xd minus alpha d are exactly the ones that vanished order in at that point. So um, that justifies this way of thinking about the symbolic powers. And it's a very geometric notion in a sense, because you can actually just use the smooth points for this calculation. And then what's usually called the zariski nagata theorem generalizes this to regular local rings. So if you have a regular local ring, um, RLR, by the way, I first saw this used to my memory, at least in a seminar that Jugal gave at Purdue way many, many years ago. And I liked it ever since. Um, you take a regular local ring and a prime and spec R, then the nth symbolic power is always in the nth power of the maximal ideal. So that uh, concludes the part I already wrote out. And from now on, I'll just be writing myself. I actually want to give a quick proof of this in, for power series rings over fields of characteristic zero. Um, so let me start by doing that. So this is a a uh, quick proof of Zariski Nagata. Um, when I take a power series ring over a field of characteristic zero. Now, of course, this whole talk is really about, supposedly about characteristic P methods, but We'll go back and forth as needed. Uh, characteristic P methods are in some, have been extremely effective in studying symbolic powers, however, as we'll see later. So um, let, um, let D, is there a question? No, okay. Let D be one of the partial derivatives. I should call it D sub I, but I'm just going to call it D. It'll be any of them. And if, um, if F is in S, let, um, I'm going to use bracket DF to denote the ideal of partials. All of them. And I want to use a basic fact. Um, which is basically the chain rule. That uh, F is always in the maximal ideal times the ideal of its partials integral closure. I, talked about integral closure last time, so I'm not going to redefine it right now. This is essentially the chain rule. I'm not going to prove it. Uh, if, by the way, if F is homogeneous, I guess I should mention this at least. Uh, if F is actually a polynomial, homogeneous polynomial of degree D, then Euler's formula shows that F is one over D times the sum of Xi, Df, Dxi. 
Oh, uh, sorry. D is the dimension. Let's put capital D here. And uh, obviously, this is actually in the idea that I've called DF. But um, in the non-homogeneous case, uh, all we can say is this. And this is, remember, characteristic 0. By the way, an, an open problem I don't know the answer to, and it's very hard to compute uh, in computer packages, is the question of whether you can move this maximal ideal outside the integral closure. So I'm going to use this fact. And I'm trying to understand Zariski Nagata. So, sorry, this is page six. Let's do that. So let let P be a prime in the spectrum of S. S is the power series here. And uh, let F be in the nth symbolic power. So there exists an element not in P such that SF is in P to the n. And now apply uh, one of the partials and use the product rule. You get that DSF plus SDF is in D P to the n. But by the product rule, that's always inside P to the n minus 1. And now this term here, F is in P to the n. And certainly P to the n is inside P to the n minus 1. So the implication is now that S times DF is in P to the symbolic n minus 1. But S is not in P. Uh, yes? Uh -huh. Professor Hineke, there's a question. OK. Uh, Arindam is asking uh, whether M can be uh, put outside the integral closure in the chain rule. Um, no. I mean, I wish I knew that. As I said, <laughs> I don't know whether M can be taken outside the integral closure here when you, you know, the way the way this is applied is to go to uh, discrete valuation rings. Uh, so um, you can't, inside the valuation ring, yes, you can take it outside. But then when you contract back to R over all the valuations, you can't. So, of course, I think some of you know that if you could move, if you could move okay. this M outside the integral closure, you would have solved the eisenbud maser conjecture in characteristic zero. So that's a hard problem, I think. It but may when, be when B equal to two, you can. This from product ah, of complete ideals is complete. Very good point. So as Jugal says, when the dimension is two, you're in a two-dimensional regular local ring, and then Zariski so proved that the product of integrally closed ideals is integrally closed. So in fact, in this case, you can, in fact, move the maximal ideal outside. That's it. Thank you. Uh, uh, Professor Hineke, I'm sorry. Yes, uh, someone who could not hear your last uh, uh, explanation, can you please uh, repeat the, uh, why this was, I think uh, she, uh, Parangama is asking uh, about that eisenberg mazur conjecture. You mentioned about eisenberg mazur conjecture. Uh, okay. Um, let me uh, let me mention that after I finish the proof, and then I'll briefly say that. Is that all right? Okay. So I'm going to finish this proof, and then I'll um, then I'll try to address that comment. So I know that S times the partial of F is in the n minus first symbolic power, but of course. 
S is not in P. So this means that actually the partials are in P symbolic in minus one. This is a well-known phenomenon. But uh, you see, this means that F, which is in the integral closure, is actually in M P to the N minus one bar. And now use induction. So we're trying to show, so I'm gonna go to another page and I'll rewrite this last line. Just to summarize. So what we've shown, that if you have an element in the nth symbolic power, that this implies F is actually in M P symbolic N minus one bar. And now, uh, now suppose um, P is in M to the K for some K, then I claim by induction on N that uh, P symbolic N is actually in M to the K plus N minus one. So this is a slight improvement of Zariski Nagata in the sense that you can specify what power of um, the maximal ideal of the original prime is in and get a slightly better answer. So we're gonna use induction. And so by what I just wrote, um, we know P symbolic N is contained in M, P to the N minus one bar. That's from uh, this argument up here. And uh, by induction, that's gonna be contained in M times M to the K plus N minus one minus one bar which is M to the, uh, what did I do wrong here? M minus K plus, yeah, pl K plus N minus one bar. But you're in a regular local ring here. And uh, the fact that GUR MS is a domain easily implies that uh, this is, in fact, just equal to the power of the maximal ideal. So again, if you're a grad student who haven't seen these before, you might try this as another easy exercise to try to understand what's going on. And that finishes the proof. So it did use this uh, statement about the partials and uh, how F relates to its own partials. And the reason that relates to Eisenbud Maser, I wasn't really gonna talk about this, but Eisenbud Maser conjecture, maybe I should since it's interesting, simply says that uh, for a regular local ring, then uh, well, if, let's just do a power series ring. It's actually, a well, okay, let me state it and then I'll make a couple comments. Then it states that uh, P symbolic two is inside M times P. Now actually, um, this is open, but in, in fact, the real, the real Eisenbud Maser conjecture, that is at least the reason they originally made it, was for regular local rings in mixed characteristic. Uh, it's false in characteristic P. Uh, but they pointed out in their paper that even for power series rings of characteristic over fields of characteristic zero, this they didn't know this. And this is still open. Um, but um, uh, so just to follow up on Arendam's comment, um, we know that P symbolic two 
is inside the integral closure of m times p since d of this ideal is inside p. So that, uh, let me go back, sorry for your, just a moment. Um, this was this argument right here that if, um, if f is a element of the nth symbolic power, then the, all the partials are in the symbolic power of one less, one less power. And um, so if I could move the M outside, which is like that, well, every radical ideal is integrally closed. So this is a big if. Um, then, um, then, of course, the second symbolic power would be contained in MP. Eisenbutt-Maser just says that you can't have a minimal generator of a prime that vanishes to order two along the ideal. That's basically what it says. So that, that's the relationship to Eisenbutt-Maser. How am I doing time? Okay. So we got quite a ways to go to, but we'll get there. Uh, I don't want to go too fast just because this is um, is for grad students mainly, but I should point out the in relationship to multiplicities, if you've never seen it before, of this Sariski Nagata theorem to multiplicities. So if, if S is uh, this power series ring as usual, and F is in S, always non-zero, then if you look at the hypersurface defined by F, this has multiplicity equal to the order of F which is just the uh, uh, defined by uh, the biggest n such that, well, it's the only n. Okay, forget these brackets. It's just n. Okay, I'm having problems here. There we go. So it's, it's just the order. So the multiplicity of this ring is the order of F. But then if, uh, if F is in P symbolic N for some P, Then locally, when you look at it locally after, sorry, after inverting P, I'm gonna, I'm going to, by abuse of notation here, I'm going to think of P as actually in spec S. In fact, and in fact, I should have written that anyway, but it is in spec S. Uh, then the order of P is um, N if um, F is not in the N plus first symbolic power. Because remember that the symbolic powers just become the powers after you localize. And so the statement that the nth symbolic power is in M to the N means exactly that the multiplicity of R localized at P is at most the multiplicity of R. And in fact, this is really, I believe, why uh, at least Nagata was 
very interested in it because he wanted to prove this statement and he did it by proving the symbolic powers. There is, um, of course, this, this statement is true in arbitrary regular um, rings, but um, there are some conditions in general on P for when this is known. All right, so let me move on to number 10. So uh, I want to move away from regular rings. So if I have a local complete ring, say, then we can't expect uh, that this will be true. for um, primes and speckle. In fact, we've already seen an example, if you remember. For the hypersurface and the prime P is XC, we saw already that um, X is in P to the N, but it's not even in M squared. So there's no way you can hope to um, prove something similar. But luckily, Chevalet, in a very classic paper, proved the following theorem. This is in 1943, I believe, in the Annals. It's called On the Theory of Local Rings. If you've never looked at it uh, for the students, Again, you really should. You'll, it'll look very familiar to a basic course in commutative algebra. Um, he proved the following. He said, let RMK be a uh, complete local domain. And uh, suppose you have a decreasing chain of ideals such that the intersection is zero. Then the way I believe he said it is there exists a function, let's call it uh, Kn going to infinity, such that uh, Jn is contained in M to the Kn. So as N goes to infinity, these uh, powers also go to infinity. Now, I would actually state it the other way around. So in terms of topologies, this means that uh, the m topology is weaker than the topology defined by the ideals JN. And you can apply this to symbolic powers because in a complete local domain, these are zero. we can apply it to the symbolic powers. And this in fact was one of the main uses often made of this theorem. Uh, by the way, uh, again, an exercise for students, if you're listening to this, uh, you might try to decide in general, if you take a prime, what the intersection of the symbolic powers is equal to. I'm claiming it's equal to zero when it's a complete domain, but what is it in general? It's a nice exercise to figure out sometime. So in particular, I would state it like this. If R is a uh, complete local domain, and P is in spec R, 
then uh, for all n, there exists a case of n such that the k-nth symbolic power is in the nth power of the maximal ideal. So I would state it the other way around. It's often in, in Chevalet's theorem, you, the n is where I put k in, and then here, the n, um, the power here is called k sub n, but it's the same thing. It just says large symbolic powers are contained in powers of the maximal ideal. And that's true for all n. So this is really where uh, I want to start. Um, there's a very influential paper of Arena Swanson, which among other things says the following. So in fact, we can, there exists a constant K or maybe I'll call it a constant C, depending on P, such that uh, the symbolic C nth power is in N to the N. So this is often called uh, uh, linearly equivalent topologies. Linear because it's a linear function of n. It's just a constant times n. And in fact, she showed much more. She showed that this was true uh, basically for any pair of ideals whose topologies are com comparable. So uh, the question I want to take up is what about trying to replace? Uh, yes. Uh, so again? Yes. Uh, Parangam is asking if uh, Swanson's result is for complete rings or any. Ah, so her her result is for any two topologies which are comparable, as long as they're uh, one is weaker than the other. It's not true in total generality, though. So there's a theorem of Schensel, which in fact uh, Jugal fixed a small gap in a long time ago, which gives a, a statements for when um, certain topologies are equivalent. But I didn't really want to go into that in this talk. But um, just suffice it to say that it's not necessarily always true. But Swanson's theorem works whenever you have basically comparable topologies. Um, okay. So. And in a complete local domain case, what I'm about to say is always true. So the question I want to take up is, um, well, let me make a statement first, and then I'll take it up. So the statement is, in fact, Swanson proved a much stronger statement, which relates to the question that in this context, so complete local domain, uh, there exists a C, again, depending on P, such that the Cnth symbolic power is not just in M to the N, it's actually in M in P to the N. And this, Really, so Swanson proved this, I believe, in uh, this was around 1997 or 8, I think. And um, there's been an explosion of work after that uh, to try to understand this constant C. So I want to state my main question right now, but then we're going to move to regular rings and characteristic P to try to um, understand it in that case first. And then I'm going to be talking in my second lecture um, more about the question itself. So let me 
state the question now, though. So I would call this a conjecture. And I guess in print, this appears in a paper of Katz, uh, Valadashti, and myself. And I think we do call it a conjecture, but I think it's I think it's worth calling it a conjecture. So it states the following. Um, let RMK be a complete local domain. And um, let, ah, period. Then there exists a constant C depending only on R. Such that for all primes in spec R, P to the symbolic C in is contained in P to the N. So this is the main conjecture, and we call this a uniform symbolic topologies. And I think it's self-explanatory what that means. The uniform is because you have one constant that works for every single prime. So this, I think, is my own feeling is quite likely to be true, but it's not going to be easy. And um, the first case you want to consider is the regular case. And there, um, there's a sequence of papers which solves it in a very strong way. So uh, Ein, Lazarsfeld, and Smith started this whole explicit business in regular rings off when they proved that uh, if basically if R is um, affine over the complex numbers, then one can take and smooth, it's all in the regular case. Uh, one can take C equal to the height of P. And in particular, that's uniformly bounded. So, um, um, the dimension of R always works. For every prime. And then, uh, soon after that, Hoxter and myself uh, did it for arbitrary, same statement. For arbitrary um, regular local rings containing the field. And this is a reduction to characteristic P argument and tight closure. And then after um, just a few years ago, Ma and Schwed proved it in mixed characteristic, same statement in mixed characteristic. So this is the regular case, what's known. So a very strong statement is known. I am gonna talk a little bit about this, um, maybe today, but probably, well, maybe. I wanna, uh, though, go first to an example to show you what some of the difficulties are. So the simplest 
some difficulties. If R is not regular. So the simplest regular, non-regular ring almost you can get is by adjoining the square root of something in a power series ring. So let, let's let S be a power series ring. So let's and uh, let A be, I think I want it in uh, M squared just to prevent trivialities from happening. And let's let R, uh, this, this should be square free, I think, just for simplicity as well. And let uh, R be the ring you get by adjoining the square root. So T is, corresponds to the square root of A. So this is a very nice multiplicity to hypersurface ring, normal. And uh, what would it take to prove our uniform conjecture here? Well, another good exercise for students, uh, good exercise, is to describe the spectrum. But rather than do that, I'm going to just pick out some very simple points. So let, um, let Q be a prime in S. And just suppose this is, these are sort of the simplest ones. Suppose that uh, mod Q, uh, there is a square root of A. So what does that mean? It means that When you go mod Q, there's an element B sub Q whose square is A. This is all taking place in S, so this is in S. Well, then the primes over little Q split up very easily. There's uh, a prime Q, which looks like uh, T minus B Q together with Q and Q prime, which is T plus BQ together with Q. And if I push these into R, then uh, they both lie over little Q and they're both primes. Now, um, when I have this vanishing, that there's a square root of A mod Q, it could be that in fact it vanishes to higher order. So let's just specify that order for a moment. So suppose we have this square root, but it vanishes to a little higher order. Let's say P to the uh, Q to the L. Well then, uh, Um, if you multiply these two together, T squared is just A when I read it in R. And so this is in QK, uh, QL, excuse me. But uh, let's focus on the big Q. Uh, T plus little T plus B sub Q is not in Q. So, uh, and um, so this forces T minus B Q. When I multiply it by T plus B Q, I get in an elf. Um, symbolic power, and that actually forces this to be in the health symbolic power. But uh, it's certainly not in Q squared. So 
So why is this relevant at all? Well, uh, what does that say? That says there's no way So Q to the L is definitely not in Q squared whenever this happens. But uh, notice as we vary little Q, there could be square roots of A mod that vanish to higher and higher orders. So I'm gonna make that a statement. So if for all L there exists a prime Q, little q and b sub q such that b sub q squared minus a actually vanishes along q to that order, then, then there does not exist a uniform c such that q symbolic cn is contained in qn for all Q and spec R. There can't be, just take N equal two. Since L is going to infinity, uh, we, need, we need a fixed power here. But we've already shown that uh, whenever such elements B sub Q exist, Q symbolic L can't be in Q squared. So no such uniform C could exist. So why, why did I go through this example in such detail? Well, you really, it is important to understand what kind of problems you're gonna uh, have to surmount to solve this. And this one says that you've gotta show, if you're gonna show this uniform property, you better show this can't happen, this statement right here. And why not? I mean, why couldn't you find square roots of a, uh, you certainly can mod mini Q, but why can't they vanish to higher and higher orders? Well, I actually don't know a simple reason. Somebody listening may know a simple reason, but in fact, let me call this sharp, this whole prop, sorry. Let me call this whole property. Sharp. sharp can't happen due to something called the strong art and approximation theorem. It's a simple case of it. But now I'm almost out of time today and I did want to move to regular rings. So I'm not going to explain this comment uh, right now. If enough people are interested, I could maybe start next time by explaining this comment. But in fact, this can't happen. So there is no contradiction. But my point is even in the very simplest case here, in which you're just adjoining a square root to a regular ring, already there's some pretty substantial difficulties you're going to have to overcome to do this. So let me turn to regular rings now. I just want to do one little fun exercise. And this whole series of talks is supposed to be about characteristic P. So I want to do one argument for you to end today, which we'll generalize immediately next time, um, which is the, fa the following famous theorem. that um, this is Auslander, Buxbaum, and I'm gonna put Nagata's name in here. It's not always put in here, but I'll explain why in a second, is that uh, arbitrary regular local rings. Or UFDs. So here you don't need characteristic P, of course. Uh, the reason I put Nagata's name in here, it always isn't put in there, is that actually Nagata reduced this problem to dimension three. And that's actually in the original paper where Auslander and Buxbaum first did it. 
Of course, I'm sure all of you who are listening have seen proofs of this, but I want to show you one you might not have seen in characteristic P, which um, leads us to why characteristic P methods are interesting and useful. So I have about four minutes. I think I can do that. So in characteristic P, let's do it. We'll uh, give a proof. So it's enough to show that height one primes are principal. That's well known and easy to see. And um, what I'm going to use about characteristic P, and I will start by explaining this a little more carefully next time, is that um, if we let I bracket P to the E denote the ideal generated by all the P to the E powers of elements of I, so applying Frobenius, then in a regular ring, as I discussed last time, um, the associated primes If I is unmixed, so is the Frobenius powers. So that's what I'm going to use. In particular, if I take my height one prime and raise it to the P to the eighth power, Frobenius power, this is unmixed. So it has only, i.e., it's actually Q primary. So this uses regular very heavily. So what? Well, we have a chain of ideals here. The Frobenius power is contained in the usual power is contained in the symbolic power. And this one's unmixed. So to determine what it is, all you have to do is localize at Q and contract. But RQ is a DVR. one-dimensional regular ring, or, or R is normal. And so uh, if a DVR, every ideal is principal. So we see that all these ideals are in fact equal when you pass to RQ. Because when you can, when you, I should put in the intermediate step here maybe. The Frobenius power, since its principle is the same as the usual power here, and when you contract them, uh, when you contract this one, you get the symbolic power. When you contract this one, you get the Frobenius power, but they're all the same. So the conclusion is that um, Q P to the E is equal to Q symbolic P to the E is equal to Q bracket P to the E. And in particular, Q P to the E is principal, is, uh, sorry, has a constant number of generators. Namely, the number of generators of Q itself, which is the same. When you apply Frobenius, you're not changing the number of generators ever. And now uh, another easy exercise. This implies by the theory of Hilbert functions that um, this associated Riesz algebra, uh, well, this implies that uh, 
q is integral over a principal ideal. But r is normal. So principal ideals are integrally closed. And therefore, Q is principal. So I'm going to end here. Gone one minute over, I apologize. What we're going to do next time is um, we'll first analyze this very strange proof of regular local rings being UFD to see how we can extend this, not just to height one primes, but to higher co-dimension. Um, and then we're going to take up um, the uniform symbolic power property. Uh, I'll talk about a little bit about what's known and give some of the proofs. Um, they're not particularly easy so I haven't totally decided um, exactly what I'm going to say truthfully, but we will certainly be using characteristic P methods a lot. So I'm going to end here, and I can take any more questions if anybody has some. So uh, thank you, Professor Henneke. Uh, Irindam is asking, do similar uniformity results hold for any other classes of ideals? Yes. Uh, I'm. I'm concentrating on prime ideals, but really everything I'm saying works uh, in much more generality. It's just a little easier to talk about prime ideals, but virtually everything I say goes over immediately for, for instance, self, self radical ideals. But there are one or two places I will use that uh, you actually need prime. So yes, thank you for that question. Uh, any other question from audience? Uh, I have a question. In fact, it's it's uh, you know from that uh, exercise that you have mentioned for um, uh, graduate students. Is it? Uh, so when you uh, said uh, that p uh, the if p is generated by a regular sequence then uh, p symbolic n is equal to pn mm -hmm. uh, so there you mentioned that pn mod pn plus 1 is a free r mod p mod n, and that yes. implies p over n is a p symbolic n is pn yes that's an exercise. So, is this uh, uh, is this uh, true if p is not a prime? Like, uh, if i n yes. mod i n plus one is free r mod i module, then i n i symbolic n is. Well, it says that uh, by induction, what that means is that the associated primes of i to the n are the same as the associated primes of i. And that's okay. more or less what you need. You have to be a little careful. You know, the, um, you know in general, uh, the symbolic powers are usually defined to be, um, let me just use it, do it this way. It's the set of all R and R such that there exists an S, a non-zero divisor mod I. Such that S times R is an I to the N. So uh, you have to avoid the associated primes of I for this. And so if the associated primes are the same, then everything is, uh, you know, works pretty much the same. There are various definitions of symbolic powers. It's not always consistent in the literature if it's not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And you have to be careful which one you're dealing with. So I, I just wanted to stick to prime ideas. OK, OK, yeah, thank you. And uh, one more <coughs> question. Uh, the associated graded ring, GRM S as a domain implies the integral closure of M power N, N power N. 
another Correct. exercise that you mentioned. So is, is this again, if you replace M by prime ideal or uh, M by any other arbitrary ideal, is that? Uh, well, it would have to be prime if it's a domain. But, um, yeah, yes. So part of the exercise for any grad student listening, whenever anybody gives you an exercise or says something you don't understand, it's really a good idea to, first of all, prove it yourself, but then generalize it as much as you can. Do where it goes. Yeah, yeah. So that's a good point. Yeah. One can say it is reduced. Right. Reduced is going to be you know, okay, so um, yes, reduced is good enough. Yeah. yeah. For arbitrary ideal, if associated ring is reduced, then all powers are integrally closed. Mm. Correct. Yeah. You're giving away the answer, Google. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, I had a question on on the uh, uh, the conjecture of Eisenberg and Bezier. That's this is uh, okay. Long time. Let ago. me go back there just to bring it up again. Yeah. I forget what page it is was on, but I didn't really want to talk on that particularly, but it's certainly very interesting. Yes, okay. Uh, so so uh, by Zariski's theory, uh, this is true in uh, dimension two. Right, so as you pointed out, true yeah. if d equal two by Zariski. Yeah, but uh, if we go to dimension three, uh, do we have a, do we know anything there? Um, so it's true if um, P is leaching, so-called leaching, for those of you in the linkage class of a complete intersection. Okay. So in okay. dimension three, it's true. So true in dimension three. Uh -huh. And the reason is, um, of course, if P is the maximum ideal, it's obvious because M squared is integrally closed. Yeah. If uh, P is height one, it's principle, as we've just talked about, and then it's, uh, mm -hmm. then P symbolic two is P squared. And finally, if it's height two, then by Hilbert Birch theorem, they're all leaching. And uh, in Eisenbud and Mazur's paper, they prove that if it's leaching, then this is correct. Okay. That is the Eisenbud Mazur. This is correct. Ah. Okay. Okay. So, um, in dimension three, it's known. Dimension four is the first case, as far as I'm aware, it's not known. Mm -hmm. For height two primes. Mm -hmm. But not Cohen Macaulay. Oh, maybe even height three primes. Yeah. I think it's not known in that case. Yeah. Unless there are a lot of people listening who may know better than me, but um, to the best of my knowledge, it's, that's not known. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. The the reason in dimension three, by the way, I think is just because they use that um, they use that this is Cohen Macaulay. And if you trace through what that means, you can easily prove this um, mm -hmm. this block statement. Okay. That's my people. Any others? Well, uh, we, we don't see any other question on the. Uh, uh, so, Edendam is asking if uh, the Eisenberg Mazur is known for I N. Ah, okay. Um, so, okay, so let me go to a new sheet. So Arendam's question is that is uh, P symbolic N in M P to the N minus one? Is that your question? Or, I mean, there are two different questions you could ask. This one for sure is wrong. Uh, this one uh, is not known. Uh, we, we've seen this in characteristic zero, but I should mention there's a, there's a conjecture of Harborn and myself 
that says for uh, regular local rings that the nth symbolic power is actually in a pretty high power. Sorry. It, um, this is not quite the same as Eisenbud Maser, but it says, it conjectures that you can improve the, um, the theorem of Ein, Lazarsfeld, and Smith, and the people I mentioned to putting in coefficients that are fairly deep inside the maximum. And um, this is another sequence. There are a lot of problems This is a I hope I got this number right. I didn't look up. And uh, it does sort of relate to the Eisenbud Maser. Okay. This this number may be slightly off. Because it Yeah. Uh, but anyway, from uh, that's another uh, series of questions. So C is a constant which is for all prime ideas. Uh, yeah, well, C here is the co-dimension. Height of P. Yeah. And uh, uh, no, that may be right. I think that might be right. So um, yeah, this is another sequence of problems which characteristic P methods are, are very useful for. That's more in the Eisenbud Maser direction. Uh, Griffo is uh, saying that it, I think you mean C minus one times N instead of C times N minus one? Uh, yes, yes. <laughs> Thanks. C, C minus one times. That looks good. I'm still not sure that's right, but that's definitely better. Uh, no, yeah, that's, that's correct. That's I mean, basically, the way to think about it is if you differentiate each time you differentiate, as we've seen, you get in the integral closure of m times the smaller power. So uh, that's always true, I guess, is this. But this takes off the integral closure and replaces the symbolic power by the power. So that is the right thing. Any other? So, so next week, as I said, I'm going to talk about the uniform symbolic power question, and I'll uh, state some theorems that are known and uh, sketch some of the proofs, especially those involving characteristic P. Okay. Good. Thank you, Greg, for your uh, nice talk, and uh, we look forward to the next lecture on uh, next Tuesday. Yep. Yeah. All right. Thank, Thank you, you for inviting me. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Bye-bye.